Thanks to Nana for requesting this video, and if you have the means to support me, please do so on patreon.com slash basicboy. Choose your fighter! The ducklings did as they were bid, but the other duck stared and said, Look, here comes another brood, as if there were not enough of us already. And what a queer-looking object one of them is. We don't want him here. And then one flew out and bit him in the neck. Let him alone, said the mother. He is not doing any harm. Yes, but he is just so big and ugly, said the spiteful duck. And therefore, he must be turned off. The others are very pretty children, said the old duck, with the rag on her leg. All but that one. I wish his mother could improve him a little. That is impossible, your grace, replied the mother. He is not pretty, but he has a very good disposition, and swims well, or even better than the others. I think he will grow up pretty, and perhaps be smaller. He has remained too long in the egg, and therefore his figure is not properly formed. And then she stroked his neck and smoothed his feathers, saying, It is a drake, and therefore not of so much consequence. I think he will grow up strong and able to take care of himself. Hello, my wonderful besties. I hope you're all well. So, I disappeared. <laughs> My apologies. To be fair though, I do upload around twice a month to my YouTube channel, so this probably doesn't come as a surprise to any of you guys. Mentally, I'm not doing too great at the moment. <laughs> I just have a lot of stuff going on in my personal life, and it just makes me creating videos very difficult, but you know, it's okay. Everyone goes through their ups and downs. But while I was away, I was scrolling through TikTok as per usual, and I found a TikTok by the user Mysticon, which reads, the part of the ugly duckling no one ever mentions is that after a lifetime of bullying, the duckling grows into a swan, the undisputed biggest asshole of the bird kingdom. Which brings me to today's topic. Whenever you guys recommend me niche 2000s shoujo series to binge, Peach Girl, Nana. All I wonder is how, how much, more much more dramatic, dramatic can it can get? get. <laughs> I don't know if you've all had the pleasure or displeasure. <laughs> of experiencing the ugly duckling transformation trope, which is prevalent in chick flicks and rom-coms. And despite this tired ass trope, I actually really enjoyed these anime. The stories were very engaging, the characters were well-developed, and overall, it was just really fun to watch. I specifically want to examine how this trope straddles the lines between gender. We'll be using the Wallflower and Skip Beat as a little case study to see how it portrays this trope. So, let's address the good and the bad, and see where these anime land. Part 1, The Origins of the Ugly Duckling. In order for us to understand the Wallflower and Skip Beat's plots, we have to talk about the Ugly Duckling because I don't think these series would have been as popular or thrived the way they did. I can imagine a lot of people who like these shows, whenever they see a social commentary YouTuber make a deep dive on it, they're like, ugh, God, this again. But I'm sorry, okay? I find it interesting, gosh. And this trope does not just exist in a vacuum, and I find the Ugly Duckling to be very capitalism motivated. That's just me. The roots of the Ugly Duckling can be traced back to Han Christian Andersen's 1843 story, where a duckling is isolated from the rest of their family because of his appearance. 
The mother duck constantly distances herself from him and tells her children not to concern themselves with him since he is causing no harm. The children go back and forth saying that he is so ugly and thus affects his mental and physical state. This triggers a desire to transform and become beautiful for self-acceptance. The story ends with him swimming with the other swans, essentially becoming one and identifying himself as pretty. This is a simple overview of the story. However, the main gist of it is that the duckling that was perceived to be ugly had to transform himself to be beautiful because that's what his mother and his siblings along with the other swans wanted him to be, which is the whole mechanism of the ugly duckling trope. It is to manifest your success in the eyes of people that you want positive reinforcement from. Remember, this trope is all about pleasing other people. This can take form in compliments, getting treated, or just receiving attention from people that you've never met before. Now for some terminology from one of my favorite websites in the world, Urban Dictionary. Ugly duckling syndrome is defined as when a person who used to be somewhat awkward and not attractive, though not necessarily unattractive, becomes extremely beautiful because this person used to be unattractive, bitter, and jealous people assume they are emotionally damaged and scarred. Hence, they believe the after forementioned beauty is mentally demented, while they themselves are sympathetically retarded. You can usually spot an ugly duckling pretty quickly because they are essentially isolated and containerized from their environment. Because people think they are not worthy of attention and will run the other way. So becoming this beautiful person on the outside is supposed to give agency to their character. However, there are implications to this quote-unquote glow up. Films like Mean Girls, The Breakfast Club, Pretty Woman, The Prince's Diaries, etc. demonize their unconventional appearance to justify their peers bullying them. These characters are written of any nuance or criticism in the eyes of the writers because they want to create a relatable character that people that similarly have situations like this can empathize with. But it's just so hard to watch. I, I can't lie. One of the earliest portrayals of this is Cinderella. Imagine yourself being torn apart by your so-called stepmother and stepsisters for not looking royal enough. Then all you need is a fairy godmother to give you a dress, glass slipper, and makeup. All of a sudden, the prince wants you and completely changes that person's personality. And just to preface, I have absolutely no problem with someone sprucing themselves up if that's what makes them truly happy. You doing what you want for your self-worth? Now that's, now my, that's kink. my kink. The issue is that they're unconventional appearance and their transformation into becoming beautiful is the end-all be-all of their emotional and physical development throughout the story. It basically gives off the theme that unless you are conventionally attractive, you're not going to be able to do things that you want to do in society. God, I hate that term. <laughs> Which similarly aligns with something I read in a Her Campus article is that the real message should of course be to treat people respectively despite their physical appearance financial background, or social status, and not try to change them. This is what these mediums seem to not imply. Also, the I'm not like other girls is so prevalent in this trope and obviously is tossed in for relatability points, but that is for another video. Part two, the premise of the wallflower. So, our main heroine, Tsunako, is a girl who doesn't know how to reciprocate love because she was dumped by her boyfriend in school. This causes her to be consumed by darkness and not reveal anything to anyone in order to avoid rejection. From the funky fits of the skeletons to the stage-lit quality of her room, they all serve the purpose to outline Tsunako's emotional state at the start of the show. Tsunako's Aunt Mine Nakamura runs the boarding house that the four boys live in. Aunt 
Mine in the first episode gives them the challenge to make Sanako into a proper lady, and in doing so, they get to live in that house for free. If they don't succeed, however, their rent will be tripled. Our homeboys must now transform slash Pygmalion slash Pretty Womanify Sanako in order for them to pay off their apartment rent. Sanako and the boys go through several challenges throughout school and life and explore what it truly means to be beautiful from the inside out. The show takes place in modern day Japan. However, it has sort of a nondescript time period. Think of the lavish mansions of Bridgerton and The Great, respectively. The comedy is completely over the top and it's kind of funny to see how out of touch some of these boys are from reality. I already don't like this. (laughs) I am not a huge fan of stories where transformations are only used to give social acceptance for the character that is perceived to be ugly. Especially in the first few episodes, they harped on this a lot. But To be fair, it was primarily to give a background to what was happening in the show, so it really did build the story quite well. The boys initially thought it would be so easy to transform Sanako into a proper lady. How can it be so hard to make a girl like girly things? (laughs) Makeup, clothes, cooking, these are all things that girls love, right? Right? Welp, Sanako is the complete opposite. She loves gore. And honey, when I tell you she loves gore, oh, I mean it. From dressing up her skeletons, having full conversations with them, and loves, loves blood. Good for her. The boys then knew that it would be way harder than they ever thought it was gonna be. And don't you even dream of trying to snatch her stuff away? However, I do appreciate that the show really took its time to develop Sanako and how the boys were so desperate in wanting to transform her because then it really helps when all the side characters are being introduced that we already know the main gist of the story. That way it's not distracted from the loads amount of storylines that are in this show. The characters all go to school. The girls are bambi eyed over all the boys because they're sexy. Sorry, young. The series is very episodic. Every episode had a point and the script was very clean and pretty seamless throughout most of the events of the show. The Haunted House Festival built itself up within the first 10 minutes of episode four and the rest of the time the students engage with the festival activities. This makes the show follow kind of a sitcom format like that of Kodacha. They also kind of make a mockery of the Ugly Duckling too. Several points throughout the entire show, the boys are even wondering why they're transforming her because other than the quote unquote darkness that pervades her personality, she still seems pretty normal and is genuinely a kind person, which are all traits that are exhibited of a quote-unquote proper lady. They all really start to have great conversations with each other and simultaneously are transforming themselves. Since it is a 2000s anime, there are some gendered stereotypes. Women who are not conventionally pretty or demure are not beautiful. From the moment I first set eyes on you, I never liked you at all. Being constantly surrounded by all those beautiful boys in spite of your ugly face. Are you one to talk? That's quite an accusation coming from a girl that no man would ever want. Kyohei primarily looking at Sanako as his personal chef. However, what's different about these wallflower characters is that they're embellished with these high stakes circumstances. And it really does enhance a lot of the characters' personalities while still maintaining realism in the story. The whole purpose of their character is to support 
why they exist in the story. Whether it's because they financially need to keep themselves stable in order to make sure that they can live, or whether it's to transform themselves into becoming a proper lady, it's all to further develop them as people. Part three, the characters. So now that we understand what the Ugly Duckling is and the premise of the show, let's talk about the characters that are in the Wallflower. There are five main characters. Sanako, Kyohei, Ranmaru, Yukinojo, aka Yuki, and Takanaga. Sanako starts out as a creepy loner who enjoys all things horror. Her character growth happens in a pretty natural way. When the boys first started coming to her, she doesn't really give them any attention since they are light creatures. Sanako said it. Not me. She wants to distance herself from them in order to not be consumed by what others want her to be. Her becoming a proper lady was seen as a nuisance to her. And even during the latter half of the show, it sufficiently counteracts the transformation trope and doesn't consume her identity. Honestly, Sanako is hilarious and I loved everything every second of it, especially with just how unfiltered she is about her thoughts and opinions on anyone and everyone. Once you've learned to look at it that way, it's so much nicer to be alone. I don't get it. You're talking about one guy, right? What is all it takes so get out? Please listen to me! <gasps> Would you mind letting me have these bloody clothes of yours? <laughs> I do think what the show missed, and I think the manga probably did a better job, is that I wish we would have seen Sanako come out of her shell more often, because it does get a little draining at times to only see her be so dark and dreary. It can get a bit repetitive, but I think that overall, it's pretty much her distinct character trait, so that wasn't gonna go away, but that's just what I personally feel like. The excitement she has over a horror mystery is like horrifically concerning, which in her defense kind of made her iconic. There were often comments made about Sanako's appearance that similarly reflect the ideologies of the Ugly Duckling. Her aunt continuously tells her that she needs to be pretty in the eyes of boys, which usually will consist of her straightening her hair, putting on makeup, her eyes widen, and her face truly comes back to life. Because you can kind of see that her face is very cartoon-like in a way. It doesn't really showcase a lot of expression until the moment where she needs to transform in front of all the people that she needs to present herself as. Sometimes you usually see it in school. Oftentimes you'll see it when there's a significant plot development, but overall it usually just keeps her as this like petite, very demure and quiet person because again, she doesn't really have any interest in being with the boys. She doesn't want company. She wants to be alone. Unlike most Ugly Duckling stories though, it focuses on her coming to terms with accepting change in her life. Slowly but surely, Sanako's dark persona becomes her strength and she uses it to her advantage. When her friends are in danger, she uses the darkness to pull them out of trouble. One of the most notable ones I see is when Kyohei was modeling and she decided to get rid of those ridiculous creepazoids, like, Ew. <laughs> Kyohei's a teenager, like, please do not do that. <laughs> Sunako is seen as new, different. Once they saw her perform these dark duties, she's not like other girls, you know? She showcases her kindness subliminally, very cryptically. Not something that can be seen at first glance, like, other girls. Are you guys beginning to see a pattern here? In my opinion, the association with darkness is eerily similar to some of the color theories that black represents 
hiding from something. Anita Bagwandis in her Refinery29 article kind of talks about this more. She talks about how there is an initial zap when you see a color. Think of when you see red. That usually symbolizes anger, fury, rage. Or if you think of a color like pink, it's usually assigned with traits of femininity. And Anita goes on to explain a lot of people's experiences and how they are trying to rid themselves of color in their gothic wardrobes. And let me know if you think I'm reading into this too much, but I think the show subliminally tells us that Sanako transforming herself into a proper lady means that she might have to get rid of her black wardrobe so that people don't associate her with her identity of being a very creepy person. Which is why I think it's so scary for the boys during the poisonous mushroom episode to see Sanako so happy. I'm not gonna go too deep into this because I'm not saying anything new or groundbreaking, but I do wanna read this quote from Anita's interview with Joe in her article, which says, I do think women wear black not to be noticed. That's what we need to change. It's not about hiding, whatever shape or size you are. What you have to get over by wearing color is that you will be noticed. Kyohei is the main focus of all the boys and he has a pretty distinct personality. He butts heads with Tsunako a lot, even going as far as to say that his kiss with her is just two lips. And I'm not gonna lie, him shoving down the skeleton towards Sanako's lips was quite funny. And I mean, at first, Kyohei is pretty unlikable, but he does end up growing on me. I thought he was a really great representation of how boisterous and obnoxious teenage boys can be. He saw Sanako as his personal chef because he wants to rekindle the memories of his family to take him to a time when he wasn't on his own. And for that, I think he clings to his earlier childhood while the rest of the boys are forced to grow up. Takanaka, I don't really have many thoughts on him. I don't know, he was just kind of there for me. I did like his romance with Noe though, it was pretty cute. Ranmaru is a complete womanizer at first, but he's fleshed out in a way that's pretty compelling. His arc with that one girl, Tamayo, it's Tamayo, I think. Ranmaru hasn't developed a real romantic connection with someone until he meets Tamayo. His parents wanted to have a cute daughter and them getting together would be beneficial for the family. Slight tangent aside, oop, I'm going off script, but I actually thought the dub and the sub was handled properly. I don't know. I actually preferred the dub on both these shows that we're going to be talking about, so yeah. Sorry for my lovely sub fans. Yuki is a total MILF and doesn't quite fit in with the rest of the boys just because he's very nice and optimistic and a little bit naive if I'm to be honest. He seems to be the most normal as well since he did grow up in a poor environment. I also relate to him quite heavily just because he was a team player and he just didn't really want to hurt anyone. Part 4 the subversion of stereotypes. One of the most integral parts of the show is that it destigmatizes the ordinary. Even in the most mundane of activities, it's still worth exploring to its fullest capacities. Most of the events take place during school, family vacations, walking around the city, the list goes on. Sanako and Kyohei are very similar in their circumstances, even though they they are polar opposites in personality. Kyohei is seen as beautiful in comparison to Sanako. Kyohei's beauty often leads him into confrontations with authority. In the haunted house in episode 4, where he is asked to model, he is admired simply for his sex appeal. He expresses how he is tired of being viewed as an object and wants to be able to make decisions for himself. 
He isn't simply loud and immature, but rather it showcases him really growing into his character and understanding that you have to be able to have sympathy for other people in order for you to truly understand them, which is why I feel like his developments with Sonako were very fleshed out and why I think they're dynamic was quite funny. They didn't really have to have a romantic relationship, even though that a lot of people, as well as the show, kind of wanted that to happen. It didn't necessarily need to happen. The ending was a bit ambiguous. It didn't quite feel like a conclusion per se, but more as an end to a certain time period in their life. Aunt Mine throws a party, expecting the boys to have completed their mission. But the boys explain to her that although her changes aren't dramatic, there are still subtle touches of it in Sanako's behavior. Aunt Mine finally says that she's happy as long as Sinako is happy. This is a great message, and I think it really did portray the ugly duckling quite well. Sinako doesn't have to be beautiful in the eyes of people, but rather, the wallflower really teaches us that the inside beauty really is more important than the outside beauty. Part 5. The Premise of Skip Beat Skip Beat follows 16-year-old Kyoko Mogami, who is madly in love with her childhood friend, Shofua. She works multiple jobs in order to support Sho's career and had to drop out of school because of that. And surprise, surprise, Sho uses her for him to rise in the music industry and deceives Kyoko all this time. This sparks Kyoko's resolve to transform herself into a star to prove that what Sho did to her will not have been in vain. She then goes to audition at Sho's rivaling music company, LME, and thinks she will make it with little to no trouble. She immediately gets kicked out as her reasons for participating are motivated by revenge. The show teaches you that in order to pursue a career, you have to fully love what it is you do. The series is one of the most popular manga with over 47 volumes. Sadly, we will not be talking about the manga before everyone gets in my grill. The show is pretty self-explanatory and the pacing is executed quite well. We see Kyoko go from her nerdy, awkward self to angry and frustrated all in one episode. I'm honestly very impressed with how much Skip Beat can pack in each of its episodes. The Ugly Duckling traits do start to pop out a little bit, especially in the scene in the first episode where her manager states, You're only 16. Don't you want to get dolled up like other girls your age? implying that working herself to death isn't conducive for her lifestyle and that girls need to be dolled up and party and go to school because that is what conventionally attractive girls usually want to participate in. Sho is painted out as the villain. He is intended to be the character everybody hates. He is so easy to hate. He is literally designed to be as frustrating as possible. And you know what? It works. But also what's kind of different about him is that he's also kind of an ugly duckling in disguise. This little trope gets a cute little remix. Sho came from the same town as Kyoko, and that would cause beef with other girls because they were jealous of her being around him. They had a very nice, wholesome friendship and were quite mature when he was younger, but he didn't know how to properly console Kyoko as she does for him. Now, truth bomb alert, <laughs> this is one of my favorite shoujo anime of all time. So in an attempt to control myself, I have compiled a list of Kyoko habits that were pretty iconic. Dressing up as Bo the Chicken during a live broadcast where she attempts to ruin Sho's life. Carves a radish rose as a flower arrangement with a knife. Dressing in hot pink tracksuits as being a part of the Love Me division. 
and also her optimism for becoming a star. The traits that I see most in Kyoko are determination, diligence, and just overall empathy. She fits the mold of a typical shoujo protagonist and she's not really limited to just being nice. Am I right, Momo Adachi? Part 6. Transformation for Validation As I've said earlier, Kyoko wants to become a star because she was betrayed by Sho. In the last part of the first episode, the makeover begins. She cuts her hair down to chin length, dyes her hair chestnut, and puts on makeup, and lo and behold, she is a completely different person. She literally looks the exact same. I'm not even joking. The writers tried to paint the picture that Kyoko was unattractive in the before scenes, but honestly, I thought she was pretty the whole time. Kyoko then waits outside, trying to get Suwada's attention to accept her in LME. And Ren Suduga pops into the scene and doesn't even give her the time of day. I've actually never seen someone so disinterested, yet so intrigued by someone. He watches over her like a guardian angel, and at times he's a bit too dense for his own good. She then continues to harass Surada in quite inappropriate and possibly illegal ways. But this is all painted to show how determined Kyoko is, but in my mind, I'm thinking the woman has now traveled all the way to his home and has stayed outside for several days. And then once Suwada gives in. She then starts to prepare for auditions. We don't really see the preparations. She just does it. And while she's outside in the hallway, she bumps into Ren, and Ren then tells her that she shouldn't audition because of her motives. Which makes Kyoko feel like shit, because for someone to demonize her when he knows nothing about her, just makes it seem like Kyoko is already starting on the short end of the stick. But above all that, she decides to brush it off and go to the audition. There are a lot of other girls that are just as eager about auditioning as Kyoko is, and then she realizes that this might be a little bit harder than I thought it was. Yet despite this, the judges are enamored by her. They love how she approaches her roles as different. During the phone call part of the audition, she built up all this anger and frustration and created a very creepy, ominous aura. She imagined Sho was on the other line and then delivered a sensitive line after the creepy persona started to fade. But she couldn't stay in that state for long, and she smashed the phone because her anger takes over being reminded of Sho departing her. It seems that everything leads back to Sho. When she is working her part-time job at a gas station, Sho appears, and instead of showing hostility towards him, she protects herself by keeping quiet. And she feels sad that Sho didn't recognize her, even though her intention was to camouflage herself in her new makeover. That in and of itself shows that her transformation is not the end-all be-all of her character growth. This makes Kyoko primarily want to look into disguising herself so that she can protect who she truly is in front of Sho, which has a little bit of a flight or fight response in terms of how she engages with people like him. Any person that exhibits any type of vein just doesn't particularly interest Kyoko. And this whole message is all about Kyoko wanting to blend into society. This is Kyoko just trying to fit in, not even to stand out. That's why when she wants to be in the entertainment industry, she's really trying to push herself as being someone that is different so that she'll enamor all of her fellow producers that want to cast her in different roles, which her ultimate objective is to be bigger 
than show. Let us not forget show's music video, which literally had show speechless because of her beauty. This is Kyoko's moment to shine. It's for her to liberate herself from all the terrible things that Sho did to her. She is no longer held back by Sho and simply performs in the music video because she wants to show show up, but also to advance her own career and gain experience. Not everything is about that scraggly little Japanese boy. The makeover is not solely her identity anymore. She wants to prove, despite the preconceived notions of her past appearance, that she is perfectly capable of portraying this eternal being that is an angel. Throughout the music video, I think it was very prevalent that Kyoko started to really transform. The producer, which name I just... Don't remember. Don't remember. <laughs> she grabs Sho to the side and makes him watch her and realize that it's not just her beauty, that she will charm him into submission because of her acting chops. Because Mamori absolutely hated Kyoko because Kyoko and Sho had so much in common and they actually had a history. But because of that history, Mamori hated Kyoko. And therefore, she wasn't going to be able to act. But just with a few moments of them being on stage, Mamori is actually smiling. She's happy and doesn't see Kyoko as what she perceived her to be. Which means that Sho realizes that Kyoko is not the same person that she was before. This is the ascent of Kyoko's character. And it really pushes through how the rest of the season unveils for her. She finally is able to go to high school and also still act part time. She's starting to figure out her feelings for Ren. And the series kind of ties a little bow to how she was completely being a person that wasn't subjected to the horrific depictions of her because of this ugly duckling trope. Part 7, The Winner. The winner of this battle, can I get a drum roll please? Is no one. I've decided that this is going to be a tie. And although these series do portray this trope very well, I still think the appeal of it has come to its end. Sadly, we were introduced to another one of these Ugly Duckling stories in the She's All That reboot, but that is neither here nor there. <laughs> read my letterbox review if you want to hear my thoughts about it. But yes, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed and want me to make more, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you in another video. Until next time, bye-bye.